Thank you. Um, this is my first ever artist talk, but it's repeat business because you and I have done this recently in Brighton and I have Force projects. And I'd like to take some small credit for the title of the show because Absolutely. one of the phrases that we discussed in that show was the paradox that in this abstract and digital world surrounding cryptocurrencies, and this is mentioned in the press release, one of the safest ways still to keep your code that is your unique, your unique code to access the bitcoins you own. One of the best ways to do it is on a piece of paper in a safe because uh, anything online, digital wallets or an exchange is hackable. And so paper is still important to us and clearly still important to you. Um, so we're here to celebrate partly the launch of this free publication, which is a literary genre that you're always particularly interested in, which is the world of the evangelical Twitter thread. Yeah. And it's a series of crisp maxims <laughs> about why this area of Bitcoin is so important and could potentially underpin uh, a new kind of utopia. Um, and so lots of your work certainly started out by using the imagery associated with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency subcultures. And one of the things that I'm most interested in is Bitcoin itself as a kind of faith and value system. And as I was coming out of the tube at Oval on their book exchange, this was on the top shelf. Um, and so therefore this is very serendipitous because this is how partly how I see this whole thing. Um, and so perhaps a good place to start is underneath this image, which is sort of the altarpiece that we're here, all here crowded around, is the image of um, Satoshi Nakamoto. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to explain a bit about who he is and why he's important? Yeah, so um, no one really knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is, which is part of the trick here. Um, we don't know if it's a he, a she, a group, uh, and this person or group of people um, are the inventors of Bitcoin. In 2008, they uh, published the uh, white paper, which is just outlining the idea of a new digital currency that is the first scarce digital currency. You can see it as like a digital gold. And in 2009, in January, the, um, the blockchain actually started working. Um, and Satoshi Nakamoto <coughs> was active in the first year or two of its launch, but then disappeared and no one knows who he is, where he is. I'm saying he, but it could be whatever. Yeah, and so he's, he's like a kind of benign God creator figure yeah. at the start of all this. And indeed, the first code for the first blocks, they were called... The Genesis Blocks. The Genesis Blocks. Um, and so this is an image of a kind of assumption of the virgin type thing. It's the, the his, him feeding that block into the world and then it's been kind of beamed up into the ether. It, it's, it's really hard to kind of portray something that is actually happening in, in space, like in cyberspace. So either you, know, either you can paint a computer person doing the computer stuff with the keyboard or then I was thinking that that's not really that attractive. So. I looked into ads in these of the 70s and 80s and found these people that were working with big generators and they were putting <coughs> things in and then started to beam them out or like broadcast them for everyone. And so that, that was the idea behind it. And so you already started uh, with photography as his medium as an artist and you were looking for ways in which you could combine your private interest in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies because you already sits here in the great position of having been an early adopter of Bitcoin. And so you-, you Allegedly. Well, you bought, when did you, when did you get your first Bitcoin? <laughs> um, 216. 216. Yeah. So that's, that's early enough to be a beneficiary of what's happened to it since. Um, and so you thought, well, photography is too direct and too literal as a way of, of marrying these worlds. And so partly what you started to do was, draw on the imagery of the subcultures around it and the metaphors that people have used to um, describe and understand what's going on. So one of the things about the nature of faith 
is that um, faith tends to be something you don't understand, understood through the lens of things you do understand. Mm. And quite often that's charismatic individuals, um, but sometimes it's metaphors and symbolic languages. And so if we, we think about what's in this area of the exhibition, behind you guys there is that image of those balls in space. Um, and do you, want to, do you want to explain a bit about what that is? Yeah, so basically it's coming out from Twitter again. It's um, one of the, um, so the creator of smart contracts, which is kind of in, works in parallel with Bitcoin. It was used in Ethereum, but Nick Sabo, uh, he wrote on Twitter that um, uh, Bitcoin is something that works like Watts engine machine. So. Um, in order to explain it, we, like we have to go back into like monetary system that you know that doesn't evolve uh, social consensus. Yes. Well, let's not go that quite back oh, okay. that far because one of the things that's interesting about uh, blockchain and Bitcoin, you, you, you hear blockchain talked about a lot now. Um, anyone in this country who's in a corporate role and has the word strategy strategy in their title will have worked on a blockchain project in the last couple of years. And it's very unusual because people are looking to deploy this solution to a problem. And you, obviously the sensible way to do things is to solve problems. Mm. Um, but and one of the things that often conf confuses me is that people who aren't aware that they have a governance problem mm -hmm. are looking to deploy blockchain because it's they think of it as technology, yeah. where really the whole thing is about governance in some sense. And the Twitter thread that you were reading was by one of these crypto evangelists, Adam Sharbo. Nick Sharbo. Oh, Nick Sharbo. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, well, yes, this is a, a governance solution, but not governance in how we usually think about it, which is top down and institutional led and, and rules based. It's kind of more like governance because there's a certain set of parameters. And in Bitcoin's case, it's just the way maths works. Yeah, it's like it's ruthlessly minimizing um, social consensus and, and just having something that works by itself. It's self-sufficient and self-regulatory. Yes. And one metaphor that explains that quite nicely. So the original diagram of what steam engine was, it was self-regulating, which meant that as the piston turned round, um, the faster it got, the more the centrifugal force was, and it pushed these balls out. And as the balls were pushed out, it closed the valve, allowing fuel into the thing, and therefore slowed it down. Yeah, so yes. it, was, it existed in a, 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 a natural state of balance, not because anyone was monitoring it and controlling it, but because the laws of physics say it has to be when you set up this arrangement. Yeah. And that's kind of what Bitcoin is. Exactly. Um, which is that the initial set of conditions and maths were set up by this Satoshi man, Nakamoto. Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, now, one of the things I'm interested in is that all of this is so complex and abstract um, that you do have, to, I think, you have to take it on faith. <clears throat> and I take it on faith, like, you tell me, you know more than I do about this, and so I believe you mm. when you say that all of this works how it says it does, because all we have to go on is the visual outputs of screens. And so none of us is really in a position to interrogate the back end of how this stuff works. But um, tell us why you're convinced that it works, or if you're not, why it doesn't matter. Um, I would say that I'm not concerned in the same way that I don't know how exactly internet works. You know, it's, um, you don't know the back end of internet. You don't know how bits are transferred from one side to another where they stored how they how they manufactured how, you know all, all of that so knowing the back end of bitcoin in such an early stage is kind of important because you still need to be quite computer literate in order not to lose your bitcoins or uh, things like that but essentially what happened with internet is also happening with bitcoin now where this knowledge of um really in depth of how the blocks are made or uh, on, you know there's a block time which is 10 minutes so every 10 minutes there's a new block you can know this or not know this and it's to the people that are developing this to tell if it's true or not but because it's based on open source um, idea so people that are developing Bitcoin 
um, they're doing this in a in an open source way. So all the all the code, all the everything behind is kind of clear to the people that understand the language of these developers that then translate it into the usage and uh, sharing these ideas to yeah. But even even that language of open source software, like most of us aren't in a position to go and check that. Mm. So we have to trust somebody. Mm -hmm. And in our last talk, you said that if we think of Bitcoin as just like a protocol in the same way that the internet is, and your example was, well, you, you can have a Skype call without necessarily understanding how that works. And where I think that analogy breaks down is it, it doesn't matter in that context how it works because if you can actually connect with someone via a Skype conversation, the fact that you're having the conversation is enough for you, you don't know how it works. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is different to that because as you say, um, the only reason Bitcoin has, a, has value is because of scarcity. Mm, well, it, it's different things, but scarcity is one of the most original things about it. Yeah. But because the scarcity is built into the system, in order for you to believe in the value, mm -hmm. you have to believe in the system that delivers the scarcity. And it's not the same, because you, as using Skype, the use is proof. Mm. Whereas with Bitcoin, the proof isn't inherent in how you use it. Well, there can be different kinds of uses of Bitcoin. You don't need to necessarily just use it in order to speculate on its future value, that it's gonna go up. You can have things like alternative, you know, like some people don't have access to their own bank account because of, I don't know, financial crisis or they limit a hundred euros per week to withdraw your money. So that's where you can choose to use something that you don't really know how it works. You just know that the value is there and you can transfer it to anywhere borderless, yeah. you know, so you have that usage. You have speculation, of course, but then you also have um, you have it as like a savings um, tool, as a savings um, technology. And if you look at it, at the last 10 years of its existence, it's been the most, the best performing asset of the last decade, and it's already the best performing asset of uh, 2020. So you, you have different kinds of usages. Oh, and then you can also do like smart contracts on top of it, which means that you have lending, you have borrowing that is linked on top of it. You don't need to know exactly how all these things work. Yeah. But the fundamental idea is that there's 21 million of them, it's borderless, and no one can um, go back and take it. And, and you, there's no third party that would yes. hold it for you. No, and, and actually, this point, which is that Bitcoin is invulnerable to an external attack, is what underpins one of my favorite bits of imagery in the show. And I'm going to go to my first audiovisual prop at this point, <laughs> because um, so one of the ways in which people have engaged with this Bitcoin community is by the layers of memes upon memes that have arisen around these forums and frankly, like quite <coughs> nerdy groups of people who are interested in this stuff. Um, and so there's this video that's had a, more than 100 million views on YouTube, and I hope this works. Um, Exploring the character of the honey badger. It's a honey badger. Watch it run in slow motion. It's pretty badass. Look, it runs all over the place. Whoa, watch out, says that bird. Ew, it's got a snake. Oh, it's chasing a jackal. Oh my gosh. Oh, the honey badgers are just crazy. The honey badger has been referred to by the Guinness Book of World Records as the most fearless animal in all of the animal kingdom. It really doesn't give a shit. If it's hungry, it's hungry. Ew, what's that in its mouth? Oh, it's got a cobra? Oh, it runs backwards? Now watch this. Look, a snake's up in the tree. Honey badger don't care. Honey badger don't give a shit. It just takes what it wants. Whenever it's hungry, it just, ew, and it eats snakes? Oh my god, watch it dig. Look at that digging. Okay, so that's probably enough of that. Really and, um, <laughs> and, and, this, and so the honey badger became, was a meme in itself. And this guy, and you will remember the history of this better than I do. Yeah, Roger Ver. Bought this billboard in the US somewhere <coughs> uh, just so he could permanently advertise the fact that Bitcoin is the honey badger of money. Yeah, it doesn't give a shit. It doesn't give a shit yeah. and can resist attacks from wherever <laughs> they come. And I, and I think I'm right in saying that this is 
honey badgers and cobras on the back of the artwork <laughs> that you now own um, in a limited edition of 200. Um, so that, that's where the honey badger comes from. Um, so in, in a way, you could also say um, that um, Bitcoin itself is anti-fragile, which is the opposite of fragile, not, not as like, um, so that it's anti-fragile would mean that with shock it benefits. So whatever, whenever Bitcoin's attacked, whenever anyone wants to reclaim it, retake it, yeah. uh, call it their own, uh, it just gains in value. It doesn't give a shit, essentially. And that's the, the energy of honey badger here. Yes, <laughs> and that results in images like, and there's one in the first room of the show, but, um, <laughs> So this is this, this originates from a photograph of Marta, your girlfriend, pet, petting a couple of dogs. <laughs> and they become honey badgers in the world where Yuri's life crosses over with um, Bitcoin memes. Um, another another symbol that you'll see a lot in these images, and there's the, you'll see on the way in there's a, there's an image of a church altar that a, a real church in Montenegro that. Mm -hmm. Can only be accessed by swimming or yeah, by yeah, boat? Yes, swimming or by boat, yeah. So that's why it's Mar Martyrs in there in a bikini. <laughs> and um, rather than the crucifix at the top of that altar, what you see is is this logo. Yeah. This is a this is a a symbol that comes up quite a lot. So this is the cover of a book um, called Cryptonomicon. Cryptonomicon. And what, mm -hmm. what's what's that book? So the book is basically um, it was published in 1999 by, by Neil Stevenson and um, in this book, it's a uh, sci-fi book and for the first time in recorded whatever was that um, he was talking about a digital gold um, that would exist online in order to um, save the humanity against terrible government um, that was putting all these regulations on people and um, they, they, they were horrible, like oppressed. <laughs> So they figured it out that if they have their own money that is based online called digital gold, um, that they would benefit. So um, the guy, the author of this book chose this symbol, um, this cross, um, which is basically an alchemist <coughs> for gold. And so if you go back and, and see what the alchemists were trying to do is that they wanted to um, transmute the, um, they wanted to, to change lead into gold in order to, to be rich, in order to enrich themselves. So if, if you say then the Satoshi Nakamoto is the first successful alchemist in the history because he changed a bunch of numbers and, and letters into digital gold, which is now Bitcoin. Um, so that is the reference with the cross in the altarpiece and also the Kaya Kwan in the first room. And one of the things that crypto evangelists talk about is that the last hundred years since the end of the gold standard have been the interregnum. Because something that you have on your money now is that it will say, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of 20 pounds. Well, so that ha that's been a lie for a long time. You can't go and get your gold now. Mm. Or you can't redeem this. And so you, you and, and others who, who believe what you believe in think that when historians come back to look at the last century, it will be regarded as being this um, aberration where our money system was completely broken mm. and where instead of money serving us as a concept, we now serve it. Yeah, it, it serves the issuer, not the people, right? So in 71, the whole world went off the, the gold standard. Um, so after the Second World War, the um, dollar became the, um, the currency of the world, essentially. And um, in 71, they decided to get off the gold standard, which, which means that they gave themselves the power to print as many banknotes as possible. And there, therefore, you have these huge pumps and dumps uh, of economy um, where you know financial crises is now happen every ten years or so, in average, and it's mostly because of um, printing too much money. It inflates, and and me and you and everyone else is losing the uh, their purchasing value, 
over yeah. a longer period of time. So Bitcoin and the community is talking about something to back up the um, uh, the currency, but to be itself uh, kind of like gold. It has all the qualities of the gold, plus it's easily transferable, easy easy to store. You, it's borderless. You you, ca you don't have to be afraid that gold is fake or it has any anything else mixed inside. So it's just a better uh, better gold. Yeah, and a lot of those qualities you've just described, and the fact that it's anonymous, borderless, and one criticism that is leveled at Bitcoin is that all of these things and its inherently unregulated nature make it the ideal tool for terrorism and organized crime for moving value around the world. And we like to think a lot about what the parallels are between Bitcoin enthusiasm and maybe the art market. And in some ways art has this thing about being portable value that suits criminals quite well as well. But um, you would say that um, that the those inherent qualities of Bitcoin aren't enough to discredit it. No, it's like saying that a terrorist drove a car, let's ban all the cars. It's the same kind of thing. The, the tool of itself, it's not important in my, in my view. Yeah, one way it isn't the same is that um, one of the reasons we have <coughs> extensive financial regulation is that it um, protects grannies investing their savings and things and losing it all and being ripped off. Um, all of us who work in regulated businesses like law firms and banks, we have these quite rigorous anti-money laundering things. Yeah. And precisely because uh, it's, although you do trade some privacy when you do those things, mm -hmm. you know, they're seen as being important checks and balances in democratic societies about stopping bad things from happening. And you're very, you, you're not happy about the fact that we're even now becoming cashless because yeah. you think it should be a human right basically to, to transact anonymously. Um, yeah, pseudo anonymously. You know, because the um, all the transactions on Bitcoin network are, are public in a publicly accessible ledger. So essentially, you are kind of public in a sense of there is the transaction that you can see on the ledger, but it's anonymous if you don't link it in any way, like with KYC or AML rules. Um, so yeah, there should there should be um, a quality of having digital cash. You know, with cash now a lot of criminals use it in order to do bad things um, but there's also cash where there's no you know AT, you know like places to pay with your card or stuff like that so there, there, with with the society going towards cashless um, there should be something that is digital equivalent of cash I believe and you're quite keen on the idea that um, if you own your own data, mm -hmm. and if you own your own patterns of spending, you own your own health data, that gives you a, a heightened level of freedom as a citizen, and you're not moved or manipulated either by governments or by corporates. Yeah, I mean, you, you're already born in the system by default. You don't choose to operate your whole life with British pound or dollar or euro. Right? Bitcoin is just a, another choice that you can make if you would like. So um, in the same way that now it's going towards, uh, what was it called, GDPR, where you claim that you have your own data, but it's a complete mess with the internet now, where you have to pick all the cookies now, and those cookies are then sold you know, to companies. It, just two days or three days ago, it came out that um, councils that were giving out benefits, they were selling the cookies that they had on their websites of the people that were um, claiming they were asking for benefits and they had problem with problems with alcohol abuse. So the councils were actually making money off from selling that data to big corporations like Google, whatever, in order to sell you more appropriate products like more <coughs> alcohol, more, you know. It doesn't make any sense why why would that just be normal? Mm -hmm. So I, I would just rather take it back and I decide when this information gets shared. Are you an alcoholic? No. Um, <laughs> so one of the things um, people have tried to pin on you over various, at various times is exactly what your political stance is. Like, are you some ultra right wing libertarian, <laughs> which has been said, or are you 
actually a complete socialist and you want to park the tanks on the lawn of capitalism, like which is it? Somewhere in between. <laughs> um, I mean, Bitcoin is seen as like an alt-right thing, but I don't believe in the idea that you can politicize money in, in this sense. Um, people will use money in different ways. It's only up to you how you, um, what benefits you, like what, what you're gonna take out and use it. But, you know, I'm, I'm completely liberal and I'm good. <laughs> and actually, one of, the, one of the things that is the clearest insight into your motives for doing anything is if we look at the works in this show that are the drawings that are essentially based on your holiday snaps and the nice moments and the things that you actually value. So that's, do you want to, why are you drawing abstract versions of your holiday snaps? Um, so if these drawings came about because people started asking me why am I studying about monetary systems and, and things that I didn't really understand about and why study about money if we know that it exists and you use it and it's fine, like the more you have the better. Um, but then in this particular project or like these paintings I started thinking uh, about my future as well. Um, you know, I, I want to have savings. I, I don't want to be at work five days a week just uh, without any savings, without any free time. And those moments where I could go for a trip or be with my friends or family or with my girlfriend, those are the, um, the moments that I value most. So, um, so I made them as like a, a reason of why I'm studying all, the, all about Bitcoin and all about monetary systems in order to make my future better, but also show that this is how I like to spend time and I, I want them to be more like future memory, memories, like I want them to be seen as like, a, you know, placeholders for my, for my memories. Yeah, and I, and I do think that's an interesting place that you're coming from because you're not making, and we all know artists who um, do some kind of performed wealth or want to be want to do things around the idea of hyper consumerism and fast cars or champagne and those aren't the images you're interested in dollar bills dollar bills you're you're more about wholesome walks by the lakes with market <laughs> and that's it's a nice way of like framing what your interest is in this speculative asset class it's about yeah it's it's just I'm being honest with these. I'm not. I'm not trying to be rich and spend it on champagne and, and cars. I just want to have nice holidays and nice time with friends and family. I mean, how lovely is that? <laughs> all, all art should be about that in some way. And, um, and one of the things that you said this morning struck me, which is um, you're saying something about inflation and how that's calculated now, and mm -hmm. how basically how that's complete bullshit. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> you what that was? so like money, the, the, the aim of the government is to, to have inflation of 2% on a yearly, yearly, and then um, the government is then trying with, you know, with interest rates and all, all the mechanisms that they have to reach that 2% per year that we would lose essentially by, by printing more or less money. Um, but we, we talked about this, um, what was it called? Con consumer price index. Exactly. CPI. Which is, they don't take into account education, they don't take into account, you know, that I want a house, that I, I, maybe I want a family. They, they, they're only taking into account uh, products, like uh, it costs this much for spaghetti, this much for that, and the price changes. Um, about this much, yeah. two percent, but they're not taking into account like the whole picture of what is modern life now, where or contemporary life now, where you have all these expenses. Which is, you know, I I went through education here was three k per year, then next year was nine k, but the the inflation rate didn't really change at all. So yeah. I, I think it's just bullshit how they measure it. So we have this fictional concept of inflation that enables us to say what um, 10 pounds today would have been in 1985 or whatever, yeah. but actually it's rubbish because to live today 
in the way that people could live in the 70s or whatever, mm. actually you need loads more money than is reflected by inflation. Exactly. Because of all the things that you've talked about. But the, the government has on their website, you can, you can put in like a hundred quid and then say, I want to see how much that was worth in uh, 1950s. Yeah. I did that and it's like uh, 400 pounds today. So yeah. it's like four times. You need four times more to survive on, on the same thing. It's ridiculous. And a couple of weeks ago, there was um, a lawyer trying to convince me that uh, I should stay on and work full time as a lawyer. And, what, and the reason he, he was saying that he has to work so hard now just to have what his parents had yeah. in a fairly relaxed, in a relaxed job. And so um, I think lots of us are kind of. I, I always think one of the things that you want to avoid in life is being imprisoned by your circumstances. So mm. some of the people whose lives I'm most terrified of are partners who have three kids in private school, uh, a partner who doesn't work, um, very expensive mortgage, and their life would literally collapse if they didn't earn half a million pounds a year, yeah. which sounds like the real first world problem. But God, that's, that is pressure. You know, you, if, you, if, if you can't just pack it up one day and do something else, Mm. then that's that's a problem. You need a regular paycheck, yeah, which is then you're just on a wheel. And I love your directness, which is not something that um, you hear much, which is you just say, well, I don't really want to work. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's weird how transgressive that sounds as a, as a, as a sentence. Like, we're so, you know, the, the idea that good things come from sweat is such a culturally ingrained thing here and elsewhere. You also need to differentiate what, what you say, I don't want to work. Like, I don't yeah. want to work <coughs> five days a week for, for, eight, you know, for eight hours, even though I have nothing to do there because yeah. I finished everything before noon. I don't want to spend six more hours uh, looking at the screen and, you know, pretending I'm, I'm there for what? You know, like, I, I can just do other stuff in that time. So I, did m I do my best. To, to survive by myself with, you know, um, and do occasional work and do other things, but to to feel the, the need to just be at work five days a week, eight hours a day in order to pay my mortgage or, you know, I don't even, I would never take a mortgage or anything like that. So yeah, it just feels horrible to me. Like I did it for four years and it was enough. <laughs> And so all of, all of the, these pictures are actually pictures of the freedom that mm. being an early Bitcoin adopter have afforded you. It's all about the belief, yeah, essentially. Um, I mean, people always say, oh, you bought in 2016, it's easy for you to talk about that. But no one knows that I bought it, like, let's say a thousand dollars of Bitcoin and then the next, in, you know, in three months, I only had three hundred dollars. I didn't sell, I just held. Because it was always just 10% of my salary that, that I kept putting in. So I, I averaged it out, which is kind of pretty good, like better than just buy it in bulk. And see it more as a savings mechanism, as like a savings account, not like I'm buying a bunch of Bitcoins now on top because I saw it on BBC that the price went really up. Therefore it should go up all the time. That's the time where I would sell, for example. So now, when, I mean, not now, I would buy it today as well, yeah. Just buy it every month what's a little the, what's bit. What's the price today? I think it's just reaching 10K right now, which is great. After <laughs> being yeah, 3,200, not that for long ago. You have a great uh, notion that, that you mentioned very casually, which is you like to exist with like a five year runoff, which means that you could basically, what, what are you talking about when you talk about the five years? Well, you mean like what I did five years ago until now, or from now to five years ahead of me? You bet, isn't it that you basically, because of like your the way you've done, you invested in Bitcoin, right? You've got a basically a five year cushion. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that that was my plan. <laughs> that that was my plan uh, from the beginning because I I saw, I I went through this Bitcoin craze pretty much. Uh, the year ahead of its all-time high, which was 20,000. Uh, but I started getting really into it when it was about 1,000. So I survived the whole um, X20 
but then I also survived from 20k down to 3,200 without selling anything stupidly but I didn't know so but I held and I never sold anything I just keep adding so yeah it's just about determination and like like thinking if this thing doesn't work I can always just go back to work yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I'm interested in, in your like notion of always the relationship between art and work is interesting and indeed the word we use to describe art objects is a work like the idea of labor is inherent mm. and I was interested this morning to talk to you about the various labor saving devices you have now come up with to generate the drawings yeah so most of the so since we last talked the drawings have become quite a lot more abstract mm. and it's always been the case that you have this kind of slightly lurid palette um, that's partly about being effective as quickly as possible. Mm. So you're into efficiency, efficiency visually anyway. Mm -hmm. But why are, the, why are the drawings now more abstract than they were, let's say, six months ago? Because I started using this tool, which basically makes the whole image for me, and then that's a sketch that yeah. I just draw out. So it's um it's a new thing. It's like um it's deep. It's called deep learning and, or AI, and it's using. Um, so what you do is you take a picture that I like from my phone with my memories or from my trips or whatever. You upload it, and then you also upload another image which is used as a as a style. So let's say you have Van Gogh, uh, whatever, and you want. Uh, your own photograph in that style as a painting. Yeah. And that's which is, which really is basically easy. how they made that entire Van Gogh movie, right? Yes. It's like horrible. Yeah. You know when you put you have a filter on Facebook where you can make a photo into a painting. Like that's how I think that film was made. Yeah. But <laughs> yours is a bit different to that because what you feed in as an input is a painting that has a color sensibility that is yours and that you like. Yeah, it's my own painting that I upload as a style. Yeah. And it's my own photograph that I upload. And this as a AI source. deep learning has a way of analyzing your image, mm -hmm. recognizing how you handle color contrast, palette, and shapes, and then can impose that on other images exactly. when you give them to work with. Yeah. And so that's how we now have the drawings of Yuri and his friends and his girlfriend. Um, in a slightly blocky abstract style mm -hmm. so they're distinctively yours in the sense that they it's it's by definition your color sensibility mm -hmm. but you remove some of the labor and getting there yeah I remove myself out of it instead of spending like, <laughs> you know, like three or four hours thinking what color to use next I just put it I just have this computer thing and it's, I mean, it's made to be a tool for artists. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, what you get out is is still digital, is a, is a JPEG. So I still have to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and like, why is that stuff therefore interest? Why do you why do you do that next step at all? Like why painting? Yeah. I don't like digital art that much. <laughs> I mean, if I'm honest, like, and you can just print them out, and it's it's not unique. It's yes, you know, and that's it's what it's just a computer generated. And that's thing. what I hoped you would say, which is actually it is logically consistent because after this loop about reproducibility, digital infinity, you get back to something that's a scarce object mm. because it's there's only one, and that you've made it by hand, and even though you have compress some of the thinking it's still a handmade drawing yeah i think that has more value with physical things I mean, as we talked about about it before that you know i could always just take pictures of miners of hardware and just have mm -hmm. photographs yeah. of that when he talks about taking pictures of miners <laughs> <laughs> oh shit yeah, yeah i always forget <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's the word for the for the people who lend their computing power to solve Bitcoin problems in return for a Bitcoin reward, ERS at the end. I'm not a yeah. native speaker. So yeah, no. Sorry. I'm here to just look after you. <laughs> um, I think that's probably all I have. Does anyone have any questions about what we've got on the walls and what what you're interested in? 
Yes. I'm so sorry if you've already spoke about this. I'm like a tiny bit late. But you, when you spoke about like you selecting images of like your friends and your life and your travels, like you must have like a bank of them. Like how do you kind of narrow down the ones that you want to make into artwork? Like what draws you to them? Um, who is on the picture? Who is in the picture? And how it looks like after I put the the filters through. So like, I would just have a ton of them, and I would I would put a ton on as well with the same filter and see what looks best, and I just pick them. It's more it's purely just aesthetic type of it. And I, I think it reminds me a bit of um. There's a there's a a good show of figurative painting on the moment at the Whitechapel. And uh, Michael Armistead uses various sources to, de to decide what he's going to paint. And he witnessed a video of a woman being ba badly stripped and abused in Kenya. And as she was turning over on the ground, um, what he related that to was she was falling in and out of the pose of the property Venus from um, by Velasquez. And I think in some way, when you look at um, the photographs you've got from your holidays you've also the, the bank of imagery that you're relating them to is this bitcoin subculture mm -hmm. so if there happens to be an image of marta playing with two dogs that relates to the honey badgers um we do have honey badgers at home now so. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> um or the elephant which is another metaphor that you like what? Yeah. Do you want so, to describe the elephant metaphor? So the, um, in the first room, there's a um, there's a little elephant on a t-shirt. Like comes, this. <clears throat> yeah, with that one. Um, so it's, it, there's a there's an in, like South South Indian story that talks about blind men and an elephant, and they all approach they're all blind and they approach an elephant uh, for the first time and they need to describe what it is. So each person. Um, one describes it as, oh, this is more like a snake thing, then this is a concrete block. So each one has their own opinion of what it is. But essentially we, you know, just looking at it, it's, it's an elephant, as you know now that it's an elephant. But it's a metaphor that's been used a lot to describe um, the internet when, when, it, when it started to, to emerge as a, as a technology and people weren't sure at a time, what it was, how to describe it, how how is it useful? Um, is it just going to be pets dot com, or is it going to be like now when you have everything online and we can't really um, imagine a world without it? So something similar is happening also with Bitcoin because each person has their own opinion and their own view and the usage that they see in Bitcoin. So you can describe it in many different ways. And you have a one hour talk now about it, so, yeah. Not quite an hour yet. Uh, so yeah. one of the things um, that Yuri now sells, because he's very conscious of his market and how you might have different <laughs> price points, is you can buy these sweaters and t-shirts from Yuri. <laughs> so I encourage you to do that. If, uh, if, you know, if you're not in the market for a drawing or a painting, Go and get this mass produced. There's Are also they... going to be hats, yeah. uh, t shirts, there's a t shirt here, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Yeah, the seven in the shop. Any, any more questions? You didn't say anything about um, what actually the paintings represent. Maybe like talk about, like, I don't know, the floating. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. That was my next question. All right. The floating. So um, I watched this talk by Bruce Sterling, which is this writer, uh, like, um, like a c cyberpunk godfather, they call him. And he's also an art critic, and he looks at culture a lot and how technology is affecting uh, the future of, of culture. And so he had this talk called Speculative Architecture, um, and he went all the way back to uh, Gulliver Trout, with you say Gulliver, yes. Gulliver's travel. Um, and there, there was this thing that, um, there was a balloon that was a self-sustainable kind of island that was floating above the earth. It was, um, um, yeah, it was just going around the world. And this guy called uh, Bruce Sterling, he was talking about the future of now. So if the earth 
you know, if we have climate change, if there's war, there's found, you know, like all these kinds of problems that we're dealing with, then in the future they're only going to amplify. Uh, he's speculating that this architecture might even exist. But why it was um, kind of it rang a bell with me was that all this sense of self sustainability and uh, being um, kind of outside of the system of some kind is that um, that's exactly what's happening with technology as well with blockchain with bitcoin with um, like projects like urbit now where you you basically create your own persona that has all your health data your your um, everything that you are as an identity from money to everything that you you are just a self-sustainable little island and you don't need a third party to actually uh, that you don't need to trust it. So that's why I like that one. And there's also a satellite next to it, which is a reference to now Bitcoin also existing in satellites. So even if there's no electricity or, or anything like that, you can still access the ledger with with the satellite. So if every server rack on Earth went out, we would still have our eight satellites. Yeah, if all 50,000 nodes disappear, there's always a copy. Yeah. Uh, and the Klein bottle behind is another. That's um, so it's um, it's the only object that exists that it needs fourth dimension to be correctly represented. So it needs time essentially. Um, it's called the Klein bottle, and you can actually have it in a physical form, but it's not a mathematically correct um, description. Uh, I mean um, presentation because it intersects itself so in the mathematical sense like in, in in a video or in a gif you can actually represent the actual shape of this thing but it cannot exist in our 3d world so why i was interested in this object was because i'm dealing with all these cypher uh, cyber kind of uh, things like cyberspace or like decentralized networks and things that are completely and utterly just super difficult to, to represent or portray is exactly that like just um, it's it was kind of hilarious to me that I would try to make a painting of a 4d object on a 2d painting you, you, like, you've explained it to me three times now and I still don't understand it <laughs> so it's like a Escher illusion that yeah, so it's doesn't like, quite work it's an object that is inside and outside at the same time <laughs> and it's no it's bound like there's no boundaries of it if you continue to walk across it you're gonna come to the same point <laughs> i'll show you on, on google later <laughs> and actually just just one more thing that i always try and ask you about but i'm going to ask you again which is you, you talked about the being a self-sustaining self-sufficient system that means you don't depend on anything you don't have to trust anyone and it's funny because that's the main thrust of Bitcoin and blockchain is to avoid having to trust anyone and to use technology to just to remove trust. And in your world and other communities, that is a utopian notion that you don't have to trust anyone. And so is there any small part of you that thinks that one way forward for society might be to build institutions in which we can trust them a bit better? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, if everything changes, I, like, I don't know. I think it's a paradigm shift, kind of. I, you, you can just choose that you don't, you don't have to trust. Like, you can still trust like your doctor, your, you know, all of that is normal. And if you want a bank account, you know, you can trust it. It doesn't matter. But I like the second option more than that I would have to trust a third party with something else. Yes, and one of the things that you like remind me and correct me, which is that um, it might be a fantasy that is just about still possible here in the UK to think that um, you can the right institutions you can trust them and things. But actually, this is much bigger than that and relates to people who currently have no access to banks whatsoever mm. and no access to institutions that have any record of uh, rule of law. I mean, now I feel as though that is all of us, but. Um, so this is something that has said it's very it's a very kind of western focused idea that strengthening institutions is the way forward when actually a lot of places don't even have the luxury of anywhere to start from yeah 
just to have this option, I think it's beneficial. Like in countries like Venezuela, where they had a complete collapse of their uh, currency because of overprinting, or in Turkey, or I mean, also just when I was still in Slovenia, I was born there. Um, we had something called dollar. It was a Slovenian um, Slovenian currency. But then suddenly we went to euro and we just lost like 50% of our savings because it didn't translate that well. And that became, that came about because of trust. If I would just have Bitcoin back then, I would put all my, <laughs> all my dollars into Bitcoin, just keep them. There's no need to go back into another fiat currency because it's essentially losing value over time. Great. All right, I think all that's left is the... Uh... <laughs>